The World as I See It, by Albert Einstein, heavily abridged. What an extraordinary situation is that of us mortals. Each of us is here for a brief sojourn, for what purpose he knows not, though he sometimes thinks he feels it. But from the point of view of daily life, without going deeper, we exist for our fellow men. In the first place, for those on whose smiles and welfare all our happiness depends. And next, for all those unknown to us personally, with whose destinies we are bound up by the tie of sympathy. A hundred times every day I am reminded myself that my inner and outer life depend on the labors of other men, living and dead, and that I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received and am still receiving. I am strongly drawn to the simple life, and am often oppressed by the feeling that I am engrossing an unnecessary amount of the labor of my fellow men. I regard class differences as contrary to justice and, in the last resort, based on force. I also consider that plain living is good for everybody, physically and mentally. To inquire after the meaning or object of one's own existence or of creation generally has always seemed to me absurd from an objective point of view. And yet everybody has certain ideals which determine the direction of his endeavors and his judgments. In this sense I have never looked upon ease and happiness as ends in themselves, such an ethical basis I call more proper for a herd of swine. The ideals which have lighted me on my way, and time after time given me new courage to face life cheerfully, have been truth, goodness, and beauty. Without the sense of fellowship with men of like mind, of preoccupation with the objective, the eternally unattainable in the field of art and scientific research, life would have seemed to me empty. The ordinary objects of human endeavor, property, outward success, luxury, have always seemed to me contemptible. My passionate sense of social justice and social responsibility has always contrasted oddly with my pronounced freedom from the need for direct contact with other human beings and human communities. I gain my own gate, and have never belonged to my country, my home, my friends, or even my immediate family with my whole heart. In the face of all these ties, I have never lost an obstinate sense of detachment, of the need for solitude, a feeling which increases with the years. One is sharply conscious, yet without regret, of the limits to the possibility of mutual understanding and sympathy with one's fellow creatures. Such a person, no doubt, loses something in the way of geniality and lightheartedness. On the other hand, he is largely independent of the opinions, habits, and judgments of his fellows and avoids the temptation to take his stand on such insecure foundations. My political ideal is that of democracy. Let every man be respected as an individual, and no man idolized. It is an irony of fate that I myself have been the recipient of excessive admiration and respect from my fellows through no fault and no merit of my own. The cause of this may well be the desire, unattainable for many, to understand the one or two ideas to which I have, with my feeble powers, attained through ceaseless struggle. I am quite aware that it is necessary for the success of any complex undertaking that one man should do the thinking and directing, and in general bear the responsibility. But the lead must not be compelled. They must be able to choose their leader. An autocratic system of coercion, in my opinion, soon degenerates. For force always attracts men of low morality and I believe it to be an invariable rule that tyrants of genius are succeeded by scoundrels. The fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. He who knows it not and can no longer wonder, no longer feel amazement, is as good as dead, a snuffed-out candle. It was the experience of mystery, even if mixed with fear, that engendered religion, a knowledge of the existence of something we cannot penetrate, of the manifestations of the profoundest reason and the most radiant beauty, which are only accessible to our reason in their most elementary forms. It is this knowledge and this emotion that constitute the truly religious attitude. In this sense, and in this alone, I am a deeply religious man. I cannot conceive of a God who rewards and punishes his creatures, or has a will of the type of which we are conscious in ourselves. An individual 
who should survive his physical death is also beyond my comprehension, nor do I wish it otherwise. Such notions are for the fears or absurd egoism of feeble souls. Enough for me the mystery of the eternity of life, and the inkling of the marvelous structure of reality, together with the single-hearted endeavor to comprehend a portion, be it never so tiny, of the reason that manifests itself in nature. Thanks for watching.